Chapter 10 There was no joy in St. Petersburg that same peaceful Saturday afternoon. The Harpers and Aunt Polly's family were in mourning. The town's residents talked little and sighed often. The children had no heart for playing. In the afternoon, Becky Thatcher moped around the deserted schoolyard. She thought, if only I'd kept the brass knob. Now I have nothing to remember him by. I'll never see him again. Tears rolled down her cheeks. A group of Tom and Joe's playmates stood looking over Aunt Polly's fence and recalling, in reverent tones, things that Tom and Joe had said and done, things that they now realized had foretold the boys' deaths. There was a dispute regarding who had last seen Tom and Joe alive. Many claimed that dismal distinction. When it was finally decided who had seen them last and exchanged the last words with them, the lucky parties acquired a sort of sacred importance and were gaped at and envied by the rest. The next morning, when Sunday school concluded, the church's bell began to toll. The townspeople began to gather, pausing a moment in the lobby to whisper about the sad event. At the pews, there was no whispering, only the rustling of funeral dresses disturbed the silence there. No one could remember a time when the little church had been so full. Following an expecting pause, Aunt Polly entered, then Sid and Mary, then the Harper family, all in black. Reverend Sprague and the congregation respectfully rose and remained standing until the mourners were seated in the front pew. There was another communing silence, broken at intervals by muffled sobs. Then Reverend Sprague spread his hands and prayed. A moving hymn was sung, followed by the text, I am the resurrection and the life. As the service proceeded, Reverend Sprague drew such pictures of the lost lad's graces, winning ways, and rare promise that everyone present felt a pang at never having noticed those virtues in the boys. Reverend Sprague related many touching incidents that illustrated the sweet, generous natures of the departed. The people easily could see now how noble and beautiful those incidents had been, although at the time they had, that they had occurred, they had seemed the worst rascalness. At last, the whole company produced a chorus of sobs. Even Reverend Sprague wept. When the church door creaked, Reverend Sprague raised his streaming eyes above his handkerchief and stood transfixed. One pair of eyes after another followed his. Then, almost with one impulse, the congregation rose and stared. The three dead boys came marching up the aisle, Tom in the lead, Joe next, and Huck sneaking shyly in the rear. They had been hiding in the vacant gallery, listening to their own funeral. Aunt Polly, Mary, and the Harpers threw themselves on their restored ones, smothered them with kisses, and poured out thanksgivings. Huck was tremendously uncomfortable. He started to slink away, but Tom grabbed him and said, Aunt Polly, it ain't fair. Somebody's got to be glad to see Huck. I'm glad to see him, poor motherless thing. The loving attentions that Aunt Polly lavished on Huck made him even more uncomfortable than he had been before. Reverend Sprague shouted, Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Sing! And they did. The triumphant burst shook the rafters. Tom looked around at all the envious boys and girls and gloried in this, the proudest moment of his life. That day, Tom got more kisses and cuffs, depending on Aunt Polly's changing moods, than he had ever had in an entire year. It had been Tom's idea that the boys return home just in time to attend their own funeral. Saturday at dusk, they had paddled to the Missouri shore on a log, landing about five miles below the town. They had slept in the woods at the town's edge until it was nearly daylight. Then they had crept through the back lanes and alleys and finished their sleep in the church's gallery. Monday morning at breakfast, Aunt Polly and Mary were very loving to Tom and very attentive to his wants. There was an unusual amount of talk. In the course of it, Aunt Polly said, Well, I don't say it wasn't a fine joke, Tom, to keep everybody suffering most a week while you boys had a good time, but it's a pity you could be hard-hearted enough to let me suffer so. If you could come over on a log to go to your funeral, you could have come over and give me a hint that you weren't dead, but only run off. Yes, you could have done that, Tom, Mary said. You'll look back some day when it's too late and wish you'd cared a little more for me, Aunt Polly said. Now, Auntie, you know that I care for you, Tom said. I'd know it better if you acted like you did. I wish now that I'd let you know I was alive, Tom said with a repentant tone. But I dreamt about you. That's something, ain't it? It ain't much. A cat does that much, but it's better than nothing. What did you dream? Wednesday night, I dreamt that you was sitting over there by the bed, and Sid was sitting by the firewood box, and Mary was next to him. Well, so we did, but we always do. And I dreamt that Mrs. Harper was here. Why, she was. Did you dream any more? I think the wind blowed the candle. Mercy on us, it did. Go on, Tom. 
It seems to me that you told Sid to shut the door. I never heard the beat of that in all my days. Don't tell me there ain't anything in dreams. Sarony Harper will know of this before I'm an hour older. I'd like to see her call this superstition. Go on, Tom. You said I wasn't bad, only mischievous, and no more responsible than... than... I think it was a cult. So it was. Then you cried. So I did. Mrs. Harper cried, too. She said that Joe was the same way and that she wished she hadn't whipped him for taking cream when she throwed it out her own self. Tom, the spirit was upon you. To Aunt Polly's growing amazement, Tom continued to describe everything as it had happened. I'm thankful to God I've got you back, Aunt Polly said. As soon as Mary, Sid, and Tom left for school, Aunt Polly called on Sarony Harper to demolish her realism with Tom's marvelous dream. Sid had this thought, which he didn't express. Pretty unbelievable, as long a dream as that without any mistakes in it. What a hero Tom was. He moved with a dignified swagger. The public eye was on him. Smaller boys flocked at his heels, proud to be seen with him. Boys of his own age were consumed with envy. They would have given anything to have his suntan skin and glittering notoriety. At school, children made such a fuss over Tom and Joe and looked at them so admiringly that the two soon were insufferably stuck up. Tom decided that he no longer needed Becky Thatcher. Glory sufficed. When Becky arrived, Tom pretended not to see her. He joined a group of boys and girls and began to talk. Becky tripped gaily back and forth with flushed face and dancing eyes, pretending to be busy chasing schoolmates and screaming with laughter when she made a capture. Tom noticed that she made her captures in his vicinity while looking in his direction. This gratified his vanity. Finally, Becky gave up and moved away, glancing wistfully toward Tom. Then she noticed that Tom was talking more to Amy Lawrence than to anyone else. She felt a sharp pang. She moved to the group and announced, almost at Tom's elbow, that her mother was planning a picnic for her. She'll let anybody come that I want. The entire group begged for invitations, except for Tom and Amy. Tom turned away coolly, still talking to Amy. Becky's lips trembled. Becky got away as soon as she could, hid herself, and cried. Then she sat with wounded pride until the bell rang, at which point she roused herself, gave her braids a shake, and determined to get revenge. At recess, Tom continued flirting with Amy. He drifted in search of Becky so that he could sting her with his performance. When he spotted her, his spirits took a dive. She was sitting on a bench with Alfred Temple. They were looking at a picture book with such absorption that they didn't seem conscious of anything else in the world. Their heads were so close together that they almost touched. Jealousy ran red hot through Tom's veins. Amy chatted happily as she and Tom walked along, but Tom's tongue had lost its function. Tom didn't hear what Amy was saying. Whenever she paused expectantly, he stammered an assent, whether or not it made sense. He kept returning to the bench where Becky and Alfred sat to sear his eyeball eyeballs with the hateful spectacle. Becky noticed and was glad to see him suffer. Amy's happy prattle became intolerable. Tom said that he had some some things to attend to, and hurried away. Any other boy, Tom thought, grating his teeth. Any boy in the whole town but that St. Louis smarty that dresses so fine and thinks he's an aristocrat. I licked him the day he came to this town, and I'll lick him again. He went through the motions of thrashing a boy, pounding the air, kicking, and gouging. At noon, Tom fled. Becky resumed her picture inspections with Alfred, but when no Tom came to suffer, she lost interest and grew miserable. Poor Alfred kept exclaiming, Oh, here's a jolly one. Look at this. Becky lost patience and said, Oh, don't bother me, and walked away. Angry and humiliated, Alfred went inside and deserted schoolhouse and contemplated the situation. He quickly guessed the truth. Becky had used him to make Tom Sawyer jealous. He wished there was some way to get Tom into trouble. He noticed Tom's spelling book. He opened to the lesson for that afternoon and poured ink onto the page. Glancing in through a window, Becky saw the action. She started home, intending to tell Tom, who would be grateful. However, before she was halfway, she changed her mind. The memory of Tom's treatment of her came scorching back. She resolved to let Tom get whipped for the damaged spelling book and also to hate him forever. Tom arrived home in a dreary mood. He had brought his sorrows to an unpromising market. The first thing his aunt said was, Tom, I have a notion to skin you alive. What have I done, Auntie? I went over to Sarony Harper and lorded that dream over her. Lo and behold, she found out from Joe that you was over here and heard all our talk that night. It makes me feel so bad that you could let me go to Sarony Harper and make such a fool of myself. 
Tom felt ashamed. Auntie, I wish I hadn't done it. I didn't think. Child, you never think of anything but your own self. You could think to come all the way from Jackson's Island to laugh at our sorrow. You could think to fool me with a lie about a dream, but you couldn't think to pity us and end our sorrow. Auntie, I know now that it was mean. I didn't mean to be mean. Besides, I didn't come here to laugh at you that night. Why'd you come here then? It was to tell you not to worry because we hadn't drowned it. I'd give the world to believe that, but why didn't you tell me then? I got all full of the idea of our coming and hiding in the church for the funeral, so I put the bark back in my pocket and kept mum. What bark? The bark I'd wrote on to tell you we'd gone pirating. I wish now that you'd waked up when I kissed you. Tenderness came into Aunt Polly's eyes. Did you kiss me, Tom? Yes. Why? Because I loved you so much and you laid there moaning and I was sorry. The words sounded like truth. With a tremor in her voice, Aunt Polly said, Kiss me again, Tom, and be off to school now. The moment he was gone, she ran to a closet and got out the ruined jacket in which Tom had gone pirating. She reached into the pocket. A moment later, she was reading Tom's piece of bark through flowing tears and thinking, I could forgive that boy now if he'd committed a million sins. Aunt Polly's affection had restored Tom's happiness. On his way to school, Tom encountered Becky. His mood always determined his manner, so he unhesitatingly ran up to her and said, I acted mighty mean today, Becky. I'm sorry, I won't ever do that again. Let's make up, all right? Becky stopped and looked at him, looked at him, looked him scornfully in the face. I'll thank you to keep to yourself, Thomas Sawyer. I'll never speak to you again, she passed on. Tom was stunned. He moped into the schoolyard, wishing that Becky were a boy so that he could trounce her. When he encountered her again, he delivered a stinging remark. She hurled one in return. In her hot resentment, Becky hardly could wait for school to start so that she could see Tom get flogged for the damaged spelling book. Silas Dobbins had reached middle age without realizing his ambition of becoming a doctor. Poverty had decreed that he rise no higher than a schoolmaster. Every day he took a mysterious book out of his desk and absorbed himself in it when no student was reciting. He kept that book under lock and key. There was not a pupil in the school who wasn't dying to glimpse it. Every boy and girl had a different theory about the nature of that book. Now, as Becky passed Dobbins' desk, she noted, noticed that the key was in the lock. She glanced around and, finding herself alone, took out the book. The title, Professor Somebody's Anatomy, conveyed no information to her. So she began to turn the pages. She came upon a human figure, stark naked. At that moment, Tom stepped in and caught a glimpse of the picture. Becky closed the book with such haste that she tore the picture. She thrust the book into the desk, turned the key, and said angrily, Tom Sawyer, you're just as mean as can be, to sneak up on a person and look at what they're looking at. How could I know you was looking at anything? You're going to tell on me, and I'll be whipped. She ran from the schoolhouse. Tom stood still, rather flustered by this outburst. He thought, girls are so thin-skinned. What's whipping, anyway? I ain't gonna tell old Dobbins on her. He'll ask who tore his book, and nobody will answer. Then he'll do what he always does, ask one pupil after another. When he comes to the right person, he'll know it. Girls' faces always tell on them. In a few moments, Dobbins arrived, and school started. Every time that Tom glanced at Becky, her face troubled him. He couldn't help pitying her. However, when Dobbins discovered the damage to Tom's spelling book, Tom focused on his own problem. Becky roused from her distress and showed considerable interest in the proceedings. Tom denied having spilling the ink, but Dobbins thought he was lying. Becky had thought that she would rejoice in Tom's predicament, but she didn't. She had an impulse to get up and tell on Alfred Temple, but she forced herself to keep silent, thinking that Tom planned to tell she had torn Dobbins's book. Tom took his whipping and returned to his seat, not at all brokenhearted. He thought he might have spilled the ink unknowingly, he had denied spilling it because denial was customary, and he'd stuck to the denial out of principle. An hour drifted by. Dobbins sat nodding in his throne. The air was drowsy with the hum of study. Dobbins straightened himself up, yawned, unlocked his desk, and took out his book. He settled himself in his chair to read. Tom shot a glance at Becky. She looked like a helpless rabbit with a gun leveled at her head. Instantly, Tom forgot his quarrel with her. Dobbins opened the book. The next moment, he faced the school. Every eye sank under his gaze, which smote even the innocent with fear. Dobbins gathered his wrath, then demanded, Who tore this book? Silence. Dobbins searched one face after another for signs of guilt. Benjamin Rogers, did you tear this book? A denial. 
Joseph Harper, did you? Another denial. Tom's uneasiness grew under the slow torture of these proceedings. Dobbin scanned the ranks of boys, considered a while, then turned to the girls. Amy Lawrence? A shake of the head. Gracie Miller? Another head shake. Susan Harper? Another negative. The next girl was Becky, Rebecca Thatcher. Rebecca Thatcher, did you tear? No, look me in the face. Becky was white with fear. Did you tear this book? Tom sprang to his feet. I done it. The school stared in amazement at this incredible folly. When Tom stepped forward to receive his punishment, the gratitude and adoration that shone in Becky's eyes were painted enough for a hundred floggings. Inspired by the splendor of his action, Tom made no outcry throughout the most merciless flogging that Dobbins had ever administered. Tom also received with indifference Dobbins's command to remain two hours after school. Tom knew who would wait outside for him until his captivity was over. Tom went to bed that night planning revenge on Alfred Temple. With shame and repentance, Becky had told him everything, but Tom's longing for revenge soon gave way to pleasanter thoughts. Tom fell asleep with Becky's last words sounding dreamily in his ear. Tom, how could you be so noble?